afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CUR 2019. This is our fifth um, national um, convention, and I hope you enjoy all the lectures here, and I especially hope you enjoy this lecture on genetics. I think you're going to find when you listen to this lecture how genetics is starting to play a role in optometry and ophthalmology now and should play a more significant role in the very near future and a very significant role in the far future. First and all, bookkeeping disclosures, I am one of the owners and organizers of CUR 2019. Uh, I developed all the lectures with the speakers, and I think you're going to find they, they're doing a great job, as they always have in the past. Uh, none of my consulting or um, speaker arrangements uh, for this lecture will really have an impact, whether it be Shire, Bachelom, or Cooper Vision. Uh, the subject matter I'm talking about is totally different, so uh, even though I'm disclosing this, it should have no bearing or biases in terms of my presentation. I think you all know the basic structure of DNA in which the three base nucleotides code for a particular amino acid, which eventually forms proteins, which keeps us alive. Um, it's a great system, and I have some um, feeling that uh, uh, this system being the one system that was ever developed uh, has uh, many reasons for that. Uh, let, let's go on to the next slide and find out what I mean. Now, why is it that Universally throughout our um, life on Earth, whether it be the smallest prion, virus, bacterium, or the human race, or an elephant, uses the same genetic code. Did life start in just one place and it proliferated all over the Earth? Did many genetic codes exist at the very beginning? And this one went out because it was simply more thermodynamically efficient, more biologically efficient? Or was life populated by um, aliens from uh, other uh, planets in the sol in other solar systems, or simply by comets um, uh, providing the essential amino acids and bases for life to develop. We really don't know the answer to this question, but it's just amazing that every single creature on Earth uses the same code. Now, with gene therapy, we're doing it because there's mistakes in the genes. There, there's many mistakes can happen. Uh, the first ones I'd like to present is a missense mutation, where there's a change in one DNA base pair. There's many others, as I'll now present. Uh, nonsense mutations occur if you change one base pair in the amino acid. Others occur uh, problems with insertions, deletions, duplications. Frameship mutations occur in the reading of the DNA code, and repeat expansion occurs when the code is repeated many times. It's not really important for you to know um, these individual types of problems. Uh, just know that as we go forward, we learn the tools that we now presently have and will develop in the future. We'll be able to solve pretty much every one of these DNA's missteps. Now, what are we doing with gene therapy presently and in the future? We're first going to be replacing a mutated gene or a problem with the genetic code that causes disease with a healthy copy of the gene. It causes disease simply by the proteins that are being formed are either non-functional, dangerous, or cause problems in the body. Uh, we also might inactivate a gene that is uh, producing a protein that is um, negative to our uh, life experience, and that's one way of doing gene therapy also. Um, we'll be finding how we can introduce a new gene into the body to help fight disease. There's several methods that are being used now that are very simple, uh, but, but very complex to develop. But the actual process uh, you'll learn is, is not that much, not, not that, that difficult. A gene, in general, a gene cannot be directly inserted into a person's cell. It needs some sort of vector, some sort of method of getting that gene into the cell. And we're going to discuss the most important methods that are presently used in eye care now, in the care of the systemic body, and uh, we'll see some of the uh, processes that will occur in the near future also. One reason we're talking about this in terms of the human eye is that the human eye is specifically a great target for gene therapy. Um, first of all, the retina is a very small area. The areas that you have to help, whether it be, let's say, for macular degeneration, uh, areas in the retina around the nerve, etc. It's a small area compared to other uh, problems in the body. Let's see if somebody needs some gene therapy for the heart or liver or lung. 
Also, the retina being part of the brain is immunoprivileged. The immune system cannot detect and react against the viruses that DNA uses as its delivery method. Therefore, it's a lot safer place to deliver um, gene therapy than elsewhere in the body. Also, the retina is very easily accessible. As you know, we do injections in the eye all the time now. Uh, it's very easy to view the retina, uh, whether it be through OCT, ERG, direct view. Um, and the cells in the retina do not regenerate over our lifetime so that we don't have to worry about new cells being produced that have genetic mistakes. So the retina itself seems to be one of the best places for gene therapy to um, be initiated. And I think you'll find that uh, it, it already has been done and it's going to be done very much more so in the near and um, intermediate and far future. Let's do the broad strokes first. I want to present the methods that we can do in gene therapy in the eye. The first one, everybody knows what adenovirus is. It's the cause of the common cold. Uh, there's actually uh, about 21 serial uh, strains of the um, adenovirus. And the AAV virus is used as a vector for delivering the genes in vivo. That means directly into the body. Um, Another very important, very elegant method is called CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Um, it recently came in the news, and I'll discuss that a little later, but I'll just whet your appetite. Um, I'm recording this lecture in mid-December, but I think it'll still be uh, news uh, in January when you hear it live. Also, in vitro stem cells can be manipulated to act as a vector to deliver the proper genes uh, to the area that's the problem. Uh, there's many others. Uh, one's called uh, zinc finger nucleases, talons. They're not important now because they're not being used in the human eye, but studies and trials are being undone, undone throughout the uh, world in terms of other areas of the body to use these techniques. I want to concentrate on the first three, though, because I think it's important that you should know them because they're being used presently and uh, they're going to be used a lot in the very near future. Let's take a look at how this occurs. In the direct delivery system or the in vivo system, um, both uh, the AVV vectors and CRISPR-9 um, will deliver this, um, pro uh, the genes to the cells in the body directly by implanting them. The process done with stem cells are we actually take cells out of the human body, either convert them or use them as stem cells, and then change the genome in these stem cells so that they would produce the proper proteins when put back into the body. Um, so the process goes a little differently from here. Now the AAV vector process, it's a non-enveloped virus. Again, it's actually the virus that causes the common cold. And it's engineered to deliver DNA to the target cells that will solve the problem of whatever the genetic mutation is. It's attracted a significant amount of influence because of the ease of delivery of it. And in fact, uh, we're going to find very shortly that it has been used uh, in the human eye. It's been shown to be a safe method because again, the body does not react to the adenovirus except to cause the common cold in other areas, but in the eye, it simply um, is uh, immunoprotected, so it won't cause a problem. Um, it has a wide range of applications. The only difficulty is that the amount of genetic information that you can put into an adenovirus is pretty small. So um, the scientists have come up with methods to use combinations of AVV vectors to actually produce more DNA and more, um, uh, let's say, uh, gene therapy. But as of now, the most simplest approaches and the ones that have been approved by the FDA have been a single AAV virus. It comes in, I believe, 21 uh, serial forms, and um, the AAV2, 3, and 4 have been sequenced. And the one that's been used almost extensively in the human eye and in the body is the AAV2 um, adenovirus. So that virus um, has now been the uh, kind of the first one uh, to easily transplant genetic material inside the, the proper uh, tissue of the body, in our case, the retina. Let's take a look at actually what happens here. Um, with the AAV virus, we insert the proper gene into the virus. The virus is then um, 
placed in the body in some manner, usually by injection in terms of the retina, and it gets incorporated into the cell of the body. Interestingly enough, the genome actually doesn't get incorporated into the chromosomes, but acts in the nucleus itself. So you see here that it's still producing the protein that it might uh, have a problem, but it's doing so in a way that um, it doesn't have to be incorporated into actual chromosomal uh, uh, parts of the DNA. Now here we're going to see how the AV virus and actually the retroviruses are used also in this capacity, and they're very similar. Um, they're both non-pathogenic. They both are integrated into the cell, um, retrovirus, excuse me, are integrated into the cell genome, and AAV viruses, as I said in the past, are not. Interestingly enough, the um, reaction to the body is very low if you deliver it subretinally, but high if you deliver it um, intravitreally. Um, they infect all dividing cells as well as non-dividing cells, but that's okay. You want to infect all the cells. Infection doesn't cause a problem. It just means that the um, process is going to cause a complete uh, genetic uh, gene therapy and, and therefore solve the problem. Um, it's a prolonged gene expression compared to if you just uh, injected the adenovirus without the um, uh, proper um, formulation of the genes. Uh, the one problem I did say is the amount of material in the AV virus that you can put in is small, um, but they're trying to get around this particular problem by using several vectors at the same time. Now the big news. Luxterna has been approved by the FDA for Libra's congenital amaurosis. That was December 2017, so approximately a year ago. Uh, the first gene therapy for a rare form of herbal vision disease has been approved. It works on the RPE65 copies using the AV2 vector that we've talked about. And it's designed to readily penetrate retinal cells to deliver therapeutic genetic cargo. A single treatment is expected to last several years. This treatment will help those with Libra's congenital amaurosis and specifically ones with a mutated RP65 gene. Um, the benefits have been shown and improves night vision and several other visual functions as we're about to see. Now the big news, the one that you've been waiting for. Luxterna has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of Libra congenital amaurosis. Um, yes, this was the first gene therapy approved for the human eye and it's being used presently. Now, um, during studies, they have shown that people with this particular condition, which is really a blinding condition, have improvements both in their light sensitivity, their ability to navigate, the ability to see in terms of just um, their particular measurement of vis visual acuity. It particularly affects the RPE65 mutation. And that mutation is being dealt with with um, an AV2 uh, vector. And what's interesting to whet all our appetites for the future, a much more common condition, retinitis pigmentosa, at least the orosomal recessive form of it is caused by RP65, at least partially. So there's a chance that we can use the same exact um, gene therapy in the future for treating retinitis pigmentosa. And there, is on, there are ongoing studies that I will show you about this. The RP65 gene, it's crucial for the visual cycle in mammals. Uh, affects things in terms of the flash of light um, when you recover. But in general, people who have two defective copies of the gene, that's why autosomal recessive um, is usually the problem. They get one bad gene from the mom and one bad gene from the dad. And over time, the light sensing cells, meaning the rods and codes, die off, causing uh, vision to be uh, poorer and poorer, both in uh, leapers and in RP. So again, I think you're going to find that going forward, uh, we're going to be using this therapy be uh, for retinitis pigmentosa, at least one uh, genetic form. As you know, um, uh, retinitis pigmentosa has a sex link component, uh, an autosomal recessive, and I believe an autosomal dominant form also. Perhaps the most elegant form of tool that we now use is the CRISPR-Cas9 technique. It's currently the simplest, most versatile, and can do many, many things in terms of changing the DMO. Um, I'll describe exactly how it works. It's a unique technology that enables geneticists and medical researchers to edit part of the genes by basically adding, removing, or altering sections of the genes. So it's basically a clip and paste uh, method. 
Um, we've talked about the AAV vector and how it's been used in Libras. However, it was first approved that Snake allows the transfer of living amount of genetic information, while the CRISPR-Cas9 actually changes the genetic code in such a way that it's much more um, versatile and can do a lot more in terms of the amount of genetic uh, manipulation and therapy um, that it can do. Let's discuss the, how CRISPR works. It can consist of two molecules that introduce a change in the DNA. The first is the Cas9. This basically acts as a molecular scissor which cuts the DNA at specific locations to allow the...